So, my name is Christer Wahlfrisson, and I'm going to talk about SMT GCC and how you can use it to find uh, wrong code bugs in GCC. So the plan for, for this talk is I will start with some slides about what SMT GCC is, how it works, and the limitations. And then the second part, we're going to talk about how you can use SMT GCC for, for testing your patches and some comments on some issues with formalizing the game plan. So, SMT GCC is essentially a collection of experiments I'm doing with SMT solvers and, uh, and analyzing Gimple and Assembly. Um, but the most interesting part here is SMT GCC TV. Uh, that is a plugin for GCC that does translation validation. So what it does is it takes the Gimple before and after each pass, and uh, it verifies that uh, the IR after the pass is a refinement of the IR before the pass. If, if it's not, that is, the, the semantics of the internal representation is not uh, consistent, that means that GCC has introduced some error in the code, so it's a wrong code bug. So to use the plugin, you just compile as usual, but with the plugin enabled. If it finds a problem, you will get an error similar to, to this, that in this case, GC has miscompiled the function F7. Uh, here it says that forward prop has changed the result of the function when you call it with the parameters y is 13 and x is 198. It previously returned 24 and now it returns 216. Um, so it's, this kind of bug is often actionable. You just make a test case out of this, test it, and you can quite easily see what's happening. I also have a version of the plugin that uh, checks the assembly code with a final gimbal. So again, you just compile as usual and, uh, and get errors if, if it finds anything. Um, this tool is less mature than the other one. I will go back to limitation in a couple of slides. So, first, what I mean with refinement here is I, I check three different things. I check that the IR of the optimization does not invoke undefined behavior for input where the IR before the optimization was defined. With input here, I'm counting both the global memory state before the function is called and the parameters. Uh, I also checked that the return value is the same for functions that return a value. And I also checked that the global memory states after the execution is correct for all input. So to use this, I use SMT solvers. So SMT solvers are tools to find solutions to a system of equations. So it returns one or three different results. Set, uh, there is a solution, and it can give you a solution. Unset, that there are no solution. Here the tool can report a proof that is actually are new solutions. So you do, do not really need to trust the tool. You can verify that the tool uh, did the work correctly. 
Unfortunately, this makes the tool slower. Um, so I'm not using proofs in any way. And then it can return unknown. That is sort of timeout, out of memory, and so on. So to, to illustrate how this works with a very trivial example, let's say we want to show that we have this source function and we have we want to show that this target function actually is a valid optimization. So in this case, we want to check that this uh, val value returned by source for A and B is equal to the value, uh, return value of the target function for all A and B. This is not a good equation to solve for solvers, so we actually check, we want to find a solution where they are different, because if it finds something that is different, we have found a bug. So uh, if we find a solution, we have found a counterexample uh, that we can reproduce the bug with. If, it's, if it says that it's unsat, then it means that the optimization is correct. So this is quite easy to do with an SMT solver. So, um, so here I'm using the Python interface for the Z3 solver, just to illustrate how this is done. So I'm using the C++ interface in my tool, but it's much more verbose, so it doesn't fit on the slide. So we create symbolic values for the input. So that is, in this case, A and B. We set up the equations, and then call the solver and print the result. So in my tool, I iterate through the through Gimple statements, and for each statement, I add it to the equations until I come to the final part of the program, and then give it to the solver. So what the solver does is essentially it tries all values uh, until the solution is found. And this, there are very many cases to try in general, especially when you look at the full memory state and so on. So it takes often sort of forever. But SMT solvers use clever method to prune the address uh, search space. So it can determine that if this bit is zero, this must be one, and so on, and in that way, get rid of actually most of the, the search space. It also has heuristics to find interesting cases. So, um, so it starts by those interesting cases. This means that if there exists a solution, that is, there is a bug in the optimization, it often tries with relevant to that first. So it often it finds a bug if there is a bug, even if it has no ability to check that there are no bugs. So for having the for test in the compiler, it's useful to, to run rather big tests that you are sure will time out because it may have found, if there are, or bugs, it may be simple to find them, and it will find them either, th either through the, the function to check is rather big. So it actually works for surprisingly big cases in reality. Undefined behavior is handled in sort of the same way. So if you want to verify this optimization, so here we add an expression for that it evaluate to true if the source has uh, undefined behavior, and we add it to our equations. So we are only interested in checking values where the value is defined. So undefined behavior in the source function essentially says, don't care about checking. We also need to do the same for the target function. In this case, the equation, well, the expression here is always false, so it's rather uninteresting. But for completeness, we also add the check here that uh, the target function does not have an undefined behavior that is not in the source.
equations does not have control flow, so what we do here is what, that we if convert everything and use conditional select instead. That obviously does not work well with loops, so we unroll loops completely. So for my tool, I unroll it 13 iterations, and if if it starts on the 14th iteration, I mark it as undefined behavior. So what that means is if it comes in in the 14th iteration, it's just skip testing. If it's in source, if it's target, it means that we have done an optimization that actually iterates more after the transformation than before. In principle, it does not need to be a bug, but I, I don't think GC has any passes that does this kind of thing. Well, a little bit asterisk, there are some, due to various limitations in my tool, there are actually cases in assembly where this can happen, but that's a bug in my tool, because I do not canonicalize loops correctly. So this works fine for, let's say, a loop like this. It can iterate many more times than 13, but the tool will check for sort of all values of n. So if it can have problems that happen before n is 13, it finds this problem. And in this function, it finds that the vectorizer has re reordered the additions. So you can get an overflow in the optimized code that was not in the original. And I reported that in this PR. But the tool cannot find bugs that happens later. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is a good start at least, and I plan to raise this limit when I make certain things faster. One bad thing is that for loops that are always iterated more than 13 times, it will always invoke undefined behavior in the source function. It will definitely not be tested at all. Um, that is a bit annoying, but uh, that's best I can do for now. There, there are ways to improve on this also, but uh, that is very low on my list of, of things to do right now. For memory, uh, we represent the memory as a large array. Arrays in the SMT solvers are lazy and pure, uh, purely functional and everything like that, persistent data structures. So we can if convert the memory state and so on. So nothing special there. We can also, since it's lazy, we can represent the full address space as an enormous array, and, and it works fine. I I will not go into details here, but I have written more about that in my blog. I also have my own internal representation. Uh, it was originally added because making it easier to do the unrolling and so on. But I soon realized that actually doing some optimi optimization there helps a lot for the performance, because uh, for the solver we want to do very different optimizations than what uh, the compiler wants to do. So, um, so even though GCC actually has done optimization on the IR, we can do different things and so on. So, uh, so, so far, what I've done is mostly optimized for me to make it easy to experiment. So if you look at the code, it's very inefficient. Uh, I have algorithms that are quadratic in number of instructions and that kind of thing, but usually we analyze rather small thing, functions anyway. Um, also when I implemented my optimizations, it's mostly I have looked at um, some some tests that I thought should be fast, that takes a long time, and try to see why it takes, a, and, and fixing those cases to verify that my theory has been correct. So I'm not trying to do general optimizations, I just did 
try to um, validate my uh, uh, my ideas. So that means that so, uh, well, some of the tests I have implemented the fixes for timed out on 10, 10 hours before and now takes milliseconds. So when I generalize my optimizations to actually cover more cases, I expect that to help many more slow things. Um, So, of course, there are limitations. The, the, pro the problem here is, uh, well, on the side, or at least NP complete, depending on, well, we have limited address space, so I guess it's, it's just NP complete exponent. So, there are things that I have not implemented. The one thing is, for example, function calls. Uh, I, just, uh, I just skip functions having it. function calls, but small functions get inlined by GCC, so, I, so it's often I check later passes of GCC even if the first passes are skipped. Exceptions are not implemented and will probably never be because it is really horrible control flow there. Um, restrict is currently ignored. Um, strict aliasing does not work, so you should use no, F no strict aliasing when using the tool. And as I said before, only loop with rather low loop bounds are analyzed. The semantics I implemented is rather imprecise. Um, my focus is to have reasonable correct, but it should not report false positives. There is one exception. Uh, static variables whose address is not taken can currently generate false positive, mm. but um, I know how to fix it and I will hopefully do it soon. The error messages reported are a bit opaque. So, um, for example, when it says that the resulting IR has more undefined behavior. It's roughly what it says. It doesn't tell you anything about what has happened. Uh, and especially on the big memory states and so on, it's maybe rather hard to find out exactly what is going on. And of course, as I said, it's MP complete. Things are slow. But I know how to improve the situation quite a bit. For the backend, uh, backend checking, we have the same restrictions from the Gimple side, but there are some additional. First, I only check risk five and the sort of basic profile. You must use FNU section anchors because I have no mapping between the address space in the assembly and um, uh, and the GIMPO when, when it used section anchors. My memory implementation only worked for 32-bit risk 5 um, That's also rather simple to fix. The, the problem here is that uh, the address allocations I do do not follow the ABI for 64-bit for uh, risk 5 which means that uh, uh, when it generates uh, other instructions that moves an address into a register, uh, it it uses um, well, it expects that the address fits in the low 32 bits and so on for for global data, and uh, my addresses need the full bit width. Uh, and there are some other random limitations that. Uh, gives false positives for memory. Uh, all of this is easy to fix, it's just that I have not prioritized it. So if you have a use case, please tell me and I'll try to give it higher priority. So 
are there any questions so far before I go into detail how to use it and so on? Okay, no questions. So, I said that there are lots of limitations, but I think the current implementation already is useful for finding corner cases when you are developing your optimizations. I'm currently compiling all C and C++ uh, test cases in the test suite, sort of weekly. I've done it for two months and have found two newly introduced bugs by that. So it seems to, to happen often enough that the tool is useful. Um, but when you write your test cases, you can write them in ways that is harder or easier for, for the tool to work with. So we Try, uh, start with the match PD rules. Uh, here I, I would say that SMT GCC can do a complete work because the optimization tests are very small and simple. It's just one transformation, just a few instruction changes, and so on. So it can go through all input values. One example happens sort of a month ago was is this bug report I reported. Um, one problem when writing the tests here is that um, the transformations can be applied already in the front end. Do we have a question? So for the match PD verifying, which sounds very useful, uh, can we actually basically make the plugin work on the GAN match side? So basically generate an SMT test case from the match PD description itself? Uh, I have tried. Uh, and the format is rather hostile for, for what I want to do here. <laughs> what? It's Lisp? <laughs> so, well, it's, it's, um, so, so if the, the, the problem from my point of view is that there are random C uh, oh, yeah, yeah. snippets in it. Um, so, uh, so there are various ways around it if, if we want to change GCC. Um, because, um, or, or uh, depending on what you, how you want to do it, uh, you may not need to change GCC either. But um, so, if, in theory, it's it's sort of easy. But as soon you can uh, uh, so, so, do so, 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 so basically, the idea, my my simple idea was that the GAN match could generate the before and the after C code for, for yeah. each of the pattern variants. Mm -hmm. But you are right, it totally misses the conditions that are written in C code mostly. Yeah. So I, I did a quick test by just um, taking the rules and generate easy small functions. Uh, I did it very naively. So in the real test, you have lots of um, checks for this must be a constant, this must be a constant that is a multiple of such and such. I did nothing like that. I just generated some random constants or some random variables and so on. And that did not find anything when I tried it, but it was a very limited test. Uh, someone ambitious could probably do much better work on, on that well, to actually check. Uh, the, f the full rules, but yeah. So we, we, because basically, 
when when we have test cases for the match PD patterns, they tend to be quite incomplete because they are not exercising all possibilities that match the C condition, right? Right, yeah. So we would kind of need to factor those in into the into the test cases themselves that yeah. gen match generate. And you could also yeah, say that if you had such tool, then then SMT GCC may not help that much either because then you could use it to actually test, yeah. <laughs> generate tests that cover the whole path. Yeah, so, 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 so you would basically generate the Python scripts <laughs> exercising the SMT solver <laughs> instead of going via yeah. the SMT GCC. Yeah. Uh, uh, testing the test cases which were uh, when the uh, so did blame on match PD and for for each commit find the test cases which were committed in the same commit and yeah test those through SMT GCC. Um, I'm not completely sure I understand how you mean. Uh, well, uh, any any change to match PD should ideally uh, be. Accompanied by by test cases yep, in, right. in the GC test suite, so so at least testing those. So I, I run those tests, yes, and that is how I found this uh, 116 and 120 bug, and uh, there was a bug in that one that if all input to w were identical, it generated the wrong result. Uh, which, uh, so. So if I continue here, so one problem is that the front end may do the folding already. So it's a, when it comes to SMT GC that start from the first SSA formed Gimple, it's, it just returns zero or something. So one example of this was added in this ticket some month back. This is an optimization that take A multiplied by not A and folds it to zero. So this, this test case were added in, uh, in that bug. And a perfectly fine test case, but it gets folded in the front end. So everything SMT GCC is, is return zero. Um, so nothing to do. Could potentially the trees that get folded by the match patterns in the front end be simple enough to generate the IR you mentioned for SNTGC, perhaps? At the time the folding happens, maybe. Um, no current infrastructure for that, as far as I know. But Right, yeah, I think that will, but I've, I'm not sure how the folding is done. I think the folding gets done uh, very early, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Right, but if you generate your IR from the generic, that's why I mentioned the trees will have to be simple enough for that case. Uh, so you will need some code to turn generic into, I think you mentioned there was an SMTGC IR you were using. Yeah. Uh, could you synthesize that from generic maybe at full? Yeah, uh, but when, when I run this test case on the dumps, I don't see any dump containing this code. It's all no, so I'm not so I don't I'm not sure <laughs> where I should hook into the process to actually get it. Um, but if 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 it's possible to do, it should not be too hard. There are some annoying things I need to implement. For example, since everything it's not an SSA form, so I need to handle that. Right, uh, but it's doable, definitely. Or just disabling the GCC source from the generic It will break a lot of stuff. It will break other stuff. So for, for, for testing just a match PD, that would be doable. If so, uh, there are other ways. If we wanted to um, modify GCC, we could sort of do a special dump that dumps all things that are folded or something, and we just verify them. Uh, so, so th th there are possibilities, definitely. Um, if if someone wants to do it, then. Uh, But 
an easier way is to write the tests. So when you write your tests, you actually check that. But actually, uh, yeah, yeah, to, to avoid the generic folding, to avoid the generic folding, the, the, and if you want a C test case, then the fix is simple. Uh, j don't do it in a single expression. You right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so that, that is what. So temporary equals not x and. Right. So that is uh, does show here that oops. So, so this was the original, and that, but if you do it like the other version, then then it works fine. So so it's mostly that when you do. When you write your tests, if you want to be able to check with my tool, you should write it in in this more complicated way <laughs> to split it up in different. But it's true that the, the GCC test for the match PD should be written in both ways that it it checks both. Yeah. One other thing that lots of tests do, well, especially very old tests, and I, I'm not sure if that is a problem any longer, it's that, uh, well, especially execution tests, just test that if it's called with one and two, it should generate value five. So if you do the test something like this, so that was just a random test I, the first test I found with this kind of problem, the, here, the SMTGC will not be able to check anything at all because it will just check that these constants uh, do the right thing, which it hopefully already does. If you had written it something like uh, the right side of it, here it will actually test that the, all values of the test function. Um, do the correct thing. But uh, as I said, I, uh, I currently compile all tests in the test suite. The test suite tests are not supposed to find new problems because, well, <laughs> They are testing that the result is correct and so on. But I still reported more than 20, I think over 30 bugs now by doing this. Uh, so um, so it's, even though some of the tests are suboptimal for, from my point of view, uh, this is a useful thing to do. If you look at the formalization of Gimple, so there are some, the documentation is not completely clear exactly what is the semantics of all parts of Gimple, and various pieces of information is unclear and incomplete. So one example here is that, let's say the built-in CLS set. The user documentation says that if x is zero, the result is undefined. At least I interpret this as it can return any value. It is not that it's undefined behavior. Um, and I, I know that uh, several users believe this, uh, especially the cryptographic side. So some of the cryptographic libraries are Oh yes, calling built-in CLZ, and then after the call to, to this built-in, they check, was it zero? Then <laughs> do something else, use the value that was calculated. Uh, the source code on the other side clearly <laughs> claims that the behavior is undefined behavior. And uh, <laughs> This is from the range implementation uh, that add ranges that actually restrict it. So it's possible to create code that get miscompiled miscompi if the semantics was that uh, the result can be whatever rather than being undefined behavior. So. Um, one of the things I have highest on my to-do list now is go through all of these 
uh, inconsistencies I know about and send mail to the mailing list and start discussion of what is the right thing to do and update the, the, the various parts of information to actually be consistent and ensure that my tool do the right thing. Well, other thing is that some of um, our internal functions, it's, it's a little bit um, unclear how to handle them. So if you take loop vectorize, for example, maybe that will disappear now when the, if conversion moves into the vectorizer, but I take it as an example anyway. So the if conversion pass may version loops and protect that by the loop vectorized. Um, and um, then the vectorizer remove the version of the loop that is not used. So I originally implemented loop vectorized to return a symbolic Boolean value. Uh, so um, that makes the tool check that both versions are are correct. Uh, so um, yeah, regardless if get vectorized or not. The problem is that it gave me um, false positives. So the simplest example of this is this function. So this is just a for loop that if x is zero, it updates account value. So the two versions of the loop look like this. The one loop vectorized is false, looks exactly as the obvious trans transformation of this, the loop. The loop vectorized version is true. The difference here is that it does the addition to count as unsigned. So let's say uh, the unsigned variable in the memory state was max int. Then the original will cause undefined behavior, and the vectorized version will not cause undefined behavior. And that is completely fine, because you are allowed to remove undefined behavior. But then we come to the next pass that vectorizes it, and it doesn't want to vectorize this. So it removes the, the one that vectorizes is true. Then my tool will see that, OK, when loop vectorized was false, is sort of an identity transformation. That's completely fine. If loop vectorize was true, then the source did not have undefined behavior, but the optimized one has undefined behavior. So it must be a bug. So, so just on the conversion pass, because it's, it's really, it, it, should be, it was discussed that it, it should be merged in vectorize. Right, yeah. With the two passes are Right. Yes. Yeah. So, so what I do right now is currently that I just ignore it and said it's all return false, and it will still find problems uh, if the loop vectorized thing were were buggy and the loop get vectorized. We will find it. So we, but we will not find latent bugs that that. The if conversion was, by some reason, created invalid code. I actually reported one such. Uh, that's not vectorized. Um, but that, that may not be a problem. Uh, but I, sort of one thing here is that when, if you add more sort of um, built-in functions of this kind, it can be good to, to at least think a little bit about what is the semantics, what is reasonable to check, and so on. So, my focus when formalized so far has been implement reasonable semantics, because most of the arithmetic and so on is rather obvious, um, and you know, avoiding false positives. But, and 
in this slides, variables, point to provenance, point to arithmetic, and so on. They interact in very interesting ways. And I have not been able to get find a semantics that uh, is reasonable for all passes and does not have false positives. So I'm, I have some things that I'm pretty sure are wrong. Uh, I have not reported yet because I'm not certain I, my semantics is correct. But I'm, I'm convinced GCC is inconsistent or it's doing stuff. So I'm, I'm pretty sure there are bugs here. <laughs> just, but you just need to find the correct semantics. So again, I will start discussing these kind of things on the mailing list uh, when I'm back home. Uh, so wrapping up, so uh, I think as the GCC TV start to get useful for checking patches, no? so, so you should start using it. Um, and let me know if there are some uh, showstoppers that makes it impossible for you to use it, and I try to prioritize that. My focus for the coming month is making the semantics correct and more precise. So again, I expect lots of questions on the mailing list, and I think you should expect some more bug reports from me in this also. And with that, I'm done and ready for questions. Uh, interesting talk, because I hadn't thought of using SMT solvers this way. My interest in SMT solvers is for super optimization. Have you looked at using your plugin actually to support op SMT based optimization? Um, well, sort of. Um, one way of doing it is sort of getting your optimizer to, to generate sort of random values, then use the SMT solver to verify that it actually is a valid optimization. And that you already can do with my tool. So I have one other plugin um, that called uh, SMT check refinement or something like that. That does essentially that. It doesn't generate any code. You have to give it two function and it verifies that they are correct. One is correct optimization by other. So that is already possible. Um, so the, then the question is how to generate what to test, and that is nothing I'm comp that interested in. Uh, the, the tools I have seen doing that kind of thing have, from my point of view, mostly looked at rather obvious things that you can decide as an experienced compiler developer anyway, because they're often you do not, not want to do certain obvious optimizations because you have the canonical form and that will make that pass worse and, and so on. So, um, but uh, if anyone is interested to build on my tool for that, uh, that would be great. So is this only for the integer uh, optimization for the floating point? It also work? A floating point works. Uh, it's a bit slower. Slower, yeah. Um, because SMT solvers doesn't like floating point that much. So the, depending on what you want to do, uh, again, the match PD kind of things where you maybe have uh, optimization, what do I know? <sighs> Doing some minor things and you want to check that it works correctly for plus minus zero or something. That kind of thing, it, it, it works perfectly fine. When you start to get up to bigger transformations, floating points make it slower. Okay. You still have, let's say, vectorization, that kind of thing. Um, there you, is, you can do vectorization with floating point values because the actual calculations should be the same. Okay, and it may be done slightly different, but the actual calculations should be done in the same order and so on, because otherwise you have a bug. Uh, and that should be easy for the solver to check, because uh, since the source and target can sort of be CSE'd, it's easy for the solver to see that 
the calculations are the same. So, so it, it works in some cases, not in others. And you cannot check fast math, for example, because then you will get different results. And then it will be complained that, OK, the result differs. <laughs> So there's a rounding error for, for the 14 pounds, this might rounding error, those kind of things. How, how no, it, this only make, it needs to have bit exact values for, for, the, for the checks to not complain. Uh, does it handle all the integer types or, or just some subset of them? Like maybe because it's RISC 532 bit, then it's, it can do in 100. Oh, for the Gimpel side, I handle it everything. Yeah. I, uh, for the new bit int or whatever they are called, I limit the size to, to uh, somewhat lower size than what the limit is in, in GCC. But otherwise, it should handle everything for integers. Uh, for floating points, I only handle 16, 32, and 64, I think. But that's a limitation in the solvers also that they are a little bit shaky for some other sizes. So um, I'm not completely sure. Do you have to target the RV32 for it to work at all? Or does it just work, not work for built-ins if you don't? Target or is 32? Uh, for, for the risk 5, it's 32 bit. Uh, for everything else, if you uh, you can run on whatever. Because for, for Gimple side, it hands everything. Okay. So my normal testing is for x86 64 bit on, on that one. Okay, so you, you can test. Yeah, and if you want to run it on uh, essentially ev any platform, so you can test your M MMX uh, and so on to the Gimple side. Okay. You can do the... Sorry? MMX says testing on numbers as well. Okay, this small number is not handled, no. <laughs> but, but, uh, but again, uh, from the Gimple side, anything... It, it may be a certain target has some built-ins and so on that are not handled, mm -hmm. that need to be added. But uh, I have done tests with uh, RISC-5, ARM, and x86, both 64 and 32-bit on, on all of them, on the Gimple level. How about 22-bit? 22 22-bits 22 I have not tried. Um, I am... It may work, uh, but probably there are, I have some assert that complains somewhere. But, um, but in general, I, I check what the precision is in the, in the type node and use that. So, so it may be that it works. So when, when the bit-in stuff was added, I, I think it, there were two asserts I needed to update it. Everything else worked. <laughs> so, but again, if you find problem, send me a test case and platform and so on, and I, I can take a look at. So it's usually quite easy for me to fix that kind of things. Yeah, it's been some twenty-five years uh, <laughs> in kind of this twenty-two bit target. <laughs> So again, my, my focus is mostly x86 for now. Um, I would say that. You, you can use that a bit <laughs> so, so the main thing that is missing for x86, there are lots of intrinsics generated by the vectorizer I, I have not implemented yet. Uh, otherwise, I, I would say most things work well there. Uh, for for risk five and arm and so on, I think there are probably more strange intrinsics and internal functions that I I should add. But but again, they are usually 
rather simple to do, just, just a matter of programming. Implementation question. So um, this is a plugin working at Gimple level, and then you translate the Gimple into your SMT solver IR. And for the backend plugin, do you translate the or parse the assembly code? I parse the .s file. Okay. Um, the reason I do the .s file instead of the code is that uh, then I don't need to deal with relocations and so on. Mm -hmm. So I thought that would be easier. I also implement all instructions myself instead of using the sale uh, definitions for risk 5 mm -hmm. the reason there is that if i would imp first this, the sale definitions are kind of complicated so actually parsing the sale files yeah. would be as hard as <laughs> implementing myself but also it generates really bad uh, ir so then I needed to add new IR optimizations to, to get the solver to actually handle that efficiently. So therefore, I add the one instructions at a time. So essentially, I compile a lot of code and say, OK, now it complains it doesn't know how to move. <laughs> uh, what that is, so I implement move, and then I run the test again. OK, now it's add on that, that, that. So until all my tests pass. Um, one good thing is that. The compiler doesn't generate that many different instructions. So even on x86 and so on, that has far too many instructions, it's still doable to implement them manually. Okay. Okay. So I guess we are done. Um, yeah, okay. I just say, sorry, where is the code? Is it um, for so download? It's on my GitHub. Uh, so actually in the abstract for this talk, there should be a link to it. Uh, there are some links in my slides also, but, but the easiest for now is probably go to the abstract. <laughs> Okay, no more questions? <laughs> yeah, I just, I just remember the question. Uh, are the loops fundamentally impossible with uh, SMT, like general loops, not, not unrolling thing? Sorry, I didn't miss the first part of what you said. Yeah. Loops fundamentally with this um, uh, with this approach yes Th there are papers telling how to do it mm -hmm. um, so but you you need to work a bit more mm -hmm. so I, I have not read them in details so I have done what was easiest for me to implement mm -hmm. yeah thank you <laughs>